Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm just, I'm grateful that I packed my snowshoes this morning. <laughs> I had no idea this was going to happen, did y'all? I literally thought like three of you were going to show up today. Me and the pastors, right? But I want you to know, I think you're the most amazing people in the world to get out on a Sunday morning and drive in that Arctic blizzard. I mean, you know, I'm from Dallas. They would have shut the whole town down if we woke up to that. So I was shocked when I walked in here and saw all of you. You're the most committed, disciplined people, and I just think the world of you. So, yes. <laughs> well, I was amazed, too, that the pastors called and wanted me to come back. I said, your, your crowd likes this voice? Like, I, I know I sound like I'm seven, but, um, you know, it's interesting. The Bible says that God speaks in a still, small voice. I have the voice of God. <laughs> That's the way I interpret that. So I'm grateful that y'all wanted me to come back. And those of you, who, how many of you have never heard me before? Raise your hand. Okay, so this is not a joke. <laughs> We're really going to minister this morning. Thank you, pastors, for having me. I just love you to pieces. I think they are the sweetest people. Do you have the best pastors? <laughs> Well, I'm going to get right into this so that we can learn something this morning since you did drive in the blizzard today. So I want you to know you're in the right, y'all are laughing about that. It is a blizzard out there, <laughs> dear Lord. Um, but I just want you to know you're in the right place at the right time. You know, I heard some, I was reading this article one time and it was talking about a certain species of fish, which I just happen to have. And they said there's a certain fish that you put them in a small aquarium and they'll stay small. You take that very same fish and you release it into a large body of water and it will grow to its intended size. The article said people are the same way. You stay in a small, limited, harsh environment, you'll stay small. But you get around people like your pastors who think big, who dream big, who talk big. You're going to grow to the size God intended for you to grow, right? So you're in the right place at the right time. Just being in a building like this causes your vision to get bigger, doesn't it? So I'm going to share with you this morning a very practical but also spiritual message about the five morning habits of the most successful people in the world. The five morning habits of the most successful people. Now, some of you have probably heard this statement before that people are rewarded in public for what they practice in private, right? In other words, it's what you do behind the scenes. It has more significance than what you do in front of people. People are rewarded in public for what they practice in private. Think about David in the Bible. You remember how he killed a lion and he killed a bear in private with nobody watching, but that prepared him to kill Goliath in public with everybody watching, right? So see, God can't use you publicly until you get victory privately. Does that make sense? So y'all may remember this. I know last year when I was here, I shared this story, but I want to remind you of it just to kind of put some, um, just put a little story to this. Do y'all remember the story I was telling about how years ago, John Maxwell was speaking at a conference and there was this young kid there who had just graduated with an MBA, and he's just admiring everything about this conference. Now, I want you to imagine 2,000 people in attendance who paid $2,000 each. Do y'all remember the pocket calculator? Okay, <laughs> let's do the math. 2,000 times $2,000, $4 million in one weekend. We've got a math guy over here. <laughs> $4 million. So this kid says to John Maxwell, he goes, um, I want to do what you do. Maxwell said, what do you think I do? He said, well, you write best-selling books, you impact lives. He said, I want to do what you do. John Maxwell said, young man, it's not a matter of doing what I do. He said, the question is, do you want to do what I did so you can do what I do? Now, here's my point. You can't have a million-dollar dream with minimum wage habits. You can't have a million dollar dream with minimum wage habits. So the kid said to Maxwell, he said, well, I want to lead a business. I want to lead a department or a team. He said, where do I start? Maxwell said, good question. Start with you. He said, if you wouldn't follow yourself, why would anyone else want to follow you? 
So I want to share this with you this morning about these five morning habits because I'm so convinced that if you'll take control of your habits, you'll take control of your life, right? So how many of you have heard John Maxwell's rule of five? Have y'all heard about the rule of five? A lot of you in business, entrepreneurs have heard of this, this rule. He coined it, but it came about years ago. This is what it is. He said to imagine that there's a tree in your backyard and you pick up an ax, which I just happen to have. <laughs> and he said, let's imagine you swing the ax five times and you put the, the ax down. You pick up the ax the next day and you swing at that tree five times, put the ax down. The next day you do it again. Every single day, if you swing at that tree five times, what eventually will happen to the tree? It's going to fall, right? He said, not 50 times, not 500 times, just five times you swing at the tree, eventually the tree is going to fall. John Maxwell said, find your tree. <laughs> he said, what is that dream, that vision, that goal, that if you were to do five things every single day, mountains of impossible dreams would begin to fall? Well, some of you may remember, but some of you haven't heard me, and it's been a year since I was here. But that's exactly what happened in my life. You know, God's done some amazing things in my life and ministry. And I feel like your pastor brings me in just to give all of you hope that, dear God, <laughs> if this will work for her, it'll work for everybody, right? But God's just done amazing things. You know, I think I just wrote my 14th book. Um, I think we have 23, 24 people on staff now. We just bought our first office building last year. Some of my friends are here and partners. I love seeing y'all. Um, we host a TV show called Live Your Dreams. Our YouTube channel has, I think, 34 million views, over a quarter of a million subscribers. Amazing things that I'm just like, what? I'm like the least likely person in the world to be doing what I'm doing. Just look at me. But, you know, some of you may remember the story, but when I was 14 years old, I was raped by a guy at a fitness center. Never dreamed in a million years I would lose my virginity on a gym floor by a complete stranger who could absolutely care less about me. And after that happened, I literally thought I was the ugliest person in the world, had such a poor self-image, could barely even look people in the eyes to talk to them. And I got into an abusive relationship after that because of just how ugly I felt. Finally got out of that relationship after two years my last semester of college at Texas Tech University, I got pregnant before marriage. I was laying in my apartment in Lubbock, Texas, scribbling in my journal, I want to die. Because I thought I'm the biggest disgrace of my family. I can't bear to tell my parents what I've done. I just felt like a failure. Well, three weeks after I found out I was pregnant, I got married. I borrowed my sister's old wedding dress. I walked down the aisle with my head down. I was so ashamed. Kenneth Copeland and my dad performed the wedding. I felt like such a loser. Three weeks after my wedding, I lost the baby. So I just felt like this big loser, big failure in life. And for 11 years after my wedding, I just got into such a rut. I just fell into this rut for 11 years. I paid my car note every month, paid my credit cards every month, went to work eight to five, had no vision for my life, no money in my savings account, just living paycheck to paycheck for 11 years, more than a decade. And all of a sudden, in 2002, I had a wake-up call. And I realized my husband and I were separated. We were this close to divorce. Nothing about my life has changed in over a decade. And by then, I had a five-year-old little girl looking to me for this role model. And I sort of looked into the future and realized Unless I do something to change, this isn't going to be just a season of regret in Terry's life. This is going to be a life of regret. And I didn't have a success coach come to the house. John Maxwell didn't show up and tell me, here's what you need to do. I just sat down one day and I made a list of five things I was going to make myself do every single day for 21 days. Because I've been told if you do something for 21 days, you can break a habit and start a new one. So I thought, I'm going to do these five things. I had no idea these five things were some of the very things the most successful people in the world do. Well, I did it for 21 days. And at the end of 21 days, I said, I'm going to go for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, I said, well, I'm going to do two months. 
Then I went for three months. Y'all, that was in 2002, and I've never stopped. This morning, I woke up in freezing Michigan, and I did the five things. So are you ready to hear what those five things are? Okay. You know, I, it's funny. I guess the weather is really affecting my voice. I kind of sound like Joyce Meyer this morning, but it must be the snow. Okay, so here we go. Number one, the first thing, these are the five things successful people do every morning. Number one is pray and meditate. Pray and meditate. Now, if you had to just choose one of the five, this is the one you want to do. Well, I began to discover the most successful people in the world meditate every day. I'm talking about people like Jennifer Aniston, Cameron Diaz, Paul McCartney, Jerry Seinfeld, Steve Harvey. Keep in mind, many of them, they communicate with the universe. I communicate, communicate with the creator of the universe, right? But I found out Joshua 1.8 says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you should meditate on it and observe to do what's in it, and you'll make your way prosperous and have good success. So God was telling us, if you want to be successful, meditate. Now, here's what my dad taught me. He said, when you go into your prayer time with the Lord, he said, always take two things with you. Take a journal and take a pen and practice Texas size pen. He said, practice hearing the voice of God. Now, I thought if God ever speaks to me, he'll probably say something like, I will smite thee with my nostrils. (laughs) But I found out that's not God. That's Jim Carrey from Bruce Almighty. But but I found out that God wants to speak to you even more than you want to listen. But you have to take the time to listen. In fact, Jim Rohn, who was one of the greatest motivators, he said a life worth living is a life worth recording. Do you know that God's word says in Jeremiah 30, verse 2, it says, write all the words I've spoken to you in a book. God wants you to journal your time with him. You know why? Because we forget. When you hear something valuable, write it down. When you need wisdom for your life, write it down. When you think God is speaking to you, but you're not even totally sure, write it down. So let me tell you this story real quick. This is a true story. A friend of mine was watching the Food Network one night, which I've never watched that because I don't know how to cook. I'm a sandwich artist, but that's about it. But she was watching the Food Network, and she said that they had this little challenge going on. Y'all seem kind of sleepy. Are you a little sleepy this morning? (laughs) Are you just frozen? Is that it? Um, So I wish my voice was more powerful so I could really wake you up, but this is as loud as it gets. So, But they were watching the Food Network, and there was some kind of contest going on that whoever won the first round got to have the number one pastry chef on their team to help them with the next contest. So this girl won, you know, and they told her, okay, well, you got the number one pastry chef to be on your team for 10 minutes to help you make whatever you want. So they start the timer. All of a sudden, the number one pastry chef walks in there. And guess what the challenge was? To make a dessert. So she's obviously going to win the whole thing, right? So the pastry chef walks in there and says, okay, what do you want me to do? And the contestant turned to this world-renowned chef, and this is what she said. I need you to cut the fruit. And the chef said, what? And the judges looked at each other, and they all said, what? And I'm sure people watching the TV were throwing fruit at the TV going, are you crazy? And the chef said to this contestant, she said, are you sure that's what you want me to do? She said, yeah, I need you to cut the fruit. She said, I've got a recipe. And you know what? she lost. And she deserved to lose. You know why? Because she didn't even know what to do with the greatness that was standing in her kitchen. And she diminished her to cutting fruit. Well, do you know that God's word says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? And God is saying to you, what do you want me to do? Just tell me, what do you want me to do? There's greatness on the inside of you. And I want you to ask me to do something big. So God wants you to listen for him. He wants to give you ideas, instruction, and wisdom. Does that make sense? Okay, number two, the second thing that I began to write down that I'm going to make myself do every single day was to read books. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I hated to read books. In fact, the only books I ever read for pleasure outside of school was the Dallas Cowboy Cheerleader Manual (laughs) and a book about gymnastics. That was it. I hated reading unless it was an assignment that I had to do. 
but I started discovering that successful people read books. Well, do you know that Hosea 4.6 says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Well, that's exactly what was happening to me. I was being destroyed. I was living paycheck to paycheck. My marriage was being destroyed. My house was a mess. My career was being destroyed. Nothing was improving because I stopped growing. In fact, y'all may remember this. I remember the dumbest thing I ever said was at my college graduation, I had my cap and gown on and I said to my family, I will never study again. I thought I've paid my dues. I finished college. I will never pick up another book. Well, I backed up my dumb promise for more than a decade. I never read another book. Well, finally, in 2002, when my life has fallen apart, I said, I guess I'm going to make myself start reading. So I set the alarm on my phone for 20 minutes, and it was like torture. I was just sitting there reading, kept looking at the alarm. Finally, it went off. But I did it again the next day, and I did it again the next day. And I did it again the next day. And something surprising began to happen. The more I read, the more I began to learn. The more I began to learn, the more I began to earn. I would go to my job and people would go, how do you know this stuff? And I'd be like, I don't know. I guess it was something I read the other day. Well, do you know what happened the next 11 years of my life? I went from ghostwriting books for other people to authoring books. I went from attending conferences to speaking at conferences. I went from watching TV for hours after work to hosting a TV show. What happened? As I began to grow, everything in my life began to grow. In fact, I remember hearing Jim Rohn make this statement. He said, do you know what the word poor stands for? Passing over opportunities repeatedly. Passing over opportunities repeatedly. And you might think like I thought. I said, why? That's just it. I haven't had any opportunities. Yes, we do. Every single day is another opportunity to get up and to invest in ourselves. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're the ones who came to church on a Sunday morning. But every day is another opportunity to invest in you. In fact, let me tell you this story real quick. This is about a friend of mine who pastors a church in Jackson, Mississippi. Years ago, when he was about 18, 19 years old, he was a, or actually 17, 18, he was a senior in high school, getting ready to graduate, go off to college. He wanted to be a businessman. And he said he's sitting in math class one day, and all of a sudden he heard this knock on the door, and for some reason he just felt in his spirit something's not right. Sure enough, the principal came and got him, took him out of class, and told him that his father had just had a massive heart attack and instantly died. He said, in one moment, my entire life changed. He said, my dad was there for breakfast. He wasn't there for dinner. Now, his dad was the pastor of a local church in Jackson, Mississippi. All of a sudden, my friend Joel, he said, it dawned on me, I can't go off to college. I need to help my mom pastor the church. So he said, I need to go to Bible school and learn how to be a pastor. So instead of going to college, he went to Rama Bible College in Tulsa, Oklahoma. While he's at Rama, he's sitting there thinking, I don't need to be here. My mom's back in Jackson struggling, trying to keep this thing going. I need to get back to Mississippi and help my mom. So he quits college, goes back home, and became the pastor at 19 years old. Can you imagine? Well, in the first year of pastoring, he lost more than half the crowd, which also means he lost more than half the income. So he said all of a sudden it dawned on him, If I don't change something, I am going to lose everything it took my father his whole life to build. I could lose it in one year. So he said, I got desperate for change. He said he went home and he took every TV out of his house. He said, I didn't want any distractions. I was desperate for change. He said, when you don't have a TV, you got a lot of time on your hands. So he said he went and bought a book. And he said, I'm going to set a goal. I'm going to read one book a week. That's 52 books a year. But he said he began to learn things. He began to study. He began to get some videos when he was at the office. He would watch videos of people like Joel Osteen. He said he was watching how Joel would use body language to really express his point. He said he was watching people like T.D. Jakes, how he would use voice inflection to really hammer his point. He said he'd watch people like John Maxwell, how he stays seated on a stool during his whole presentation, but when he really wants to make a point, 
he'll stand up and address the crowd. He said, I was just observing everything. Well, do you know, 10 years later, he pastors more than 5,000 people. He paid off his church building $11.5 million at 29 years old. You know what Joel said? As I began to grow, everything in my life began to grow. We can do this, can't we? Okay, so the second habit was reading. The third habit, number three, is I found out successful people listen. They listen to audio messages. They use their drive time to listen to messages on their way to work and on their way home. They're constantly filling their minds with information, with knowledge and wisdom. Well, we know that God's word says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? Everybody knows that that you have to hear God's word in order for your faith to grow. Well, all of a sudden during that season of my life, I was so undisciplined, y'all may remember this. I actually got a post-it note and I wrote push play. (laughs) And I put this on my bathroom mirror. So I thought, okay, if I'm gonna be consistent, I've gotta figure out when I'm gonna do this. And I thought, well, I gotta get ready in the morning anyway. Takes a long time to look like this. I might as well (laughs) push play. So I got up the first morning. I went in there. I saw the mirror. and I said, oh, yeah, push play. And I pushed my big CD player. And I started hearing God's word, hearing God's word, hearing God's word. Faith comes by hearing, right? Romans 10, 17. Well, here's the thing about hearing God's word. It's not like having the prices right on in the background. When you're hearing God's word, it gets down on the inside of you and it starts to change you from the inside out, right? I begin to hear things like, don't share big dreams with small minds. Don't share big dreams with small minds. Small-minded people have a way of sucking the faith right out of you. But big-minded people have a way of elevating you to reach your potential. In fact, I remember hearing this story and it was about a guy who said, He was struggling in life, nothing was changing. And he said, one day, he just looked around at his closest friends. And he said, I realized two things about my closest friends. Number one, they hated hard work. And number two, they had no intention or desire to improve their lives. So he said, he walked up to this very wealthy, successful man. And he said, if you could give me any advice to help improve my life, what would it be? He said, the wealthy man said four words keep the right company, keep the right company. So he said, I did. He said, I went home and I just made a simple list. He said, if someone could drag me down, I put their name on the list and I spent no more than five minutes with them. If someone could improve my life, I put their name on the list and I spent as much time as possible with them. He said, after following the make it or break it list, within three years, he was a millionaire. Keep the right company. Now, how did I learn this? As I'm gluing my eyelashes on, I'm learning this stuff. (laughs) So that was just a simple habit. And you know, this is the easiest of all the habits because you don't have to stop what you're doing to listen. You can listen while you're driving, listen while you're loading the dishwasher, listen while you're folding laundry. I still do it to this day. I woke up at the hotel and I push play as I'm getting ready. Can we do it? Okay, number four, the fourth habit. Y'all doing okay this morning? Okay, the fourth habit, number four, is I found out successful people take the time to write their dreams and goals. Now, y'all may remember me teaching on this because this is my passion. I'm a cheerleader of dreams. But I found out that this principle came from God's word. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish, right? So if you don't have a vision for your life, you're just existing, You're just perishing. And that's what was happening to me for 11 years. That's why my life didn't get better. There was no vision. But I also found out that with vision, you come alive. Well, then I began to discover successful people don't just have vision. They take the time to write the vision. Everybody from Jim Carrey, Katy Perry, Beyonce, Ellen DeGeneres, Justin Timberlake, Connor McGregor, I found out successful people take the time to get their dreams out of their head and onto a piece of paper. But then I found out this didn't come from Katy Perry. This came from God's word. Habakkuk 2.2 says, write the vision, make it plain. Why? So you can run when you read it. This proves you're serious when you put your dreams in writing, right? So y'all have heard the stories. I began to do this. In fact, I remember as I'm putting my makeup on, 
I heard a story from Jim Rohn. And he said that this was back when he was struggling. He had no money in the bank. He said, I had pennies in my pocket. He said, I was full of excuses. I blamed everybody for where I was in life. And he said, his mentor said to him one day, he said, Jim, go get your list of goals. I think I can help you with something. Jim said, I don't have my list of goals. He said, where are they? Are they out in the car or something? Go get it. He said, no, I've never written a list of goals. He said, what? You've never put your goals in writing? He said, no. He said, well, then I bet I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. He said, that got my attention. He said, you mean my bank balance would be higher if I had a list of goals? His mentor said, drastically higher. So from that day on, he began writing his dreams and goals. And of course, five years later, he became one of the greatest success coaches the world ever knew. Well, as I began to learn that, I thought, if this will happen for someone like him, why wouldn't it happen for me? So I started writing my goals. You know, y'all, y'all may remember funny stories. I put a fake picture of me and John Maxwell. This is totally fake. I cut him out, cut me out, taped it together. And I said, I speak at events with John Maxwell, acting like we're buddies in the picture. <laughs> I went to Joyce Myers conference. I printed out a picture of Joyce, chopped off Joyce's head and put my head on top. And I said, I'm invited to speak at the largest churches and conferences in the world. It looked ridiculous. Now, I know we have a Dutch community here, right? There's a lot of Dutch in here. The Lord just put the Dutch language in my heart. And I said, I put a map of the Netherlands. And I said, my books are translated in five languages. And one of them is Dutch. I didn't know anybody that could do something like that. But I put it in there. I put a picture of offices and said, we have beautiful offices on the lake in Rockwall, Texas. Well, do y'all remember me teaching you last year? that there's a principle in God's word that you become what you behold. You become what you behold. Whatever you keep before your eyes, it will eventually show up in your life. Do you think it's a coincidence that now I speak at events with John Maxwell? In fact, he's my guest speaker next year. John Maxwell, here I am. I don't even have to show you a picture. Here I am speaking at one of the largest churches in America. That's not coincidental, is it? Here we are, um... My book translated in the Dutch language. Here we are last year. We got our first offices in Rockwell, Texas on the lake. None of that's coincidental, is it? Here's the principle. When the vision is clear, the results will appear. When the vision is clear, the results will appear. So what is a clear vision for you for this year? If it really is to be debt-free, then you need to know exactly how much debt you owe. Get clear on the vision. If it's to get your body in shape, what does a body in shape look like to you? Get a picture of it. Chop off someone else's head and put your head on top. I do it all the time. (laughs) Whatever it is, if you're saying, I want my career to grow, what does that even mean? Put it in writing. Get clear on what that means. So let me tell you this story. I thought this was so cute. This is a true story about a little girl because I want you to know this will work for anybody. But this precious little girl, Liz, this is back in the 1980s. When she was about six years old, her dad left her, and her mom was working two jobs to try to provide for her. And she, as she started growing up, you know, she was about 11 years old by then. Her mom's working two jobs, and she said, Honey, my goal is to have enough money to one day send you to college so you can then get a good job. And she said, Mommy's dream is that one day you're going to take me on a trip around the world. Well, her mom's working those jobs, working late hours. One day, Liz's aunt came to her and she said, honey, your mom's working so many hours. You're by yourself. She said, I think you need to join the Girl Scouts so it'll give you something to do. So Liz gets in the Girl Scouts and right as she gets in, she finds out, this is so amazing, that whoever sells the most boxes of cookies (laughs) wins a trip for two around the world. Liz said, that's all I needed to hear. She said, I don't have to wait till my mom gets enough money to send me to college and I get a job. She said, I'm going to win this thing and make my mom's dream come true. So every single day after school, Liz would go knocking on doors. Would you like to buy a box of cookies? Every single day, she's asking people. Well, finally, the apartment manager came to Liz and her mom and said, honey, We're getting so many complaints because she would go knock on doors and then the very next day she'd show up again. Would you like to buy a box of cookies? 
So people started complaining and saying, this is really getting old. She comes to the same door. So they said, honey, you can't knock on anybody's door anymore. But they said, here's what we'll let you do. We'll let you set up a little table by the elevator and you can put your little booth there and, and sell your cookies. So Liz said, this worked even better. She said, they have to come by me to get to the elevator. I don't have to go to them. But she also changed her cell strategy. She said she cleaned her uniform every day, had it ironed pretty. Every single day after school, she set up her little booth because her vision was so clear, right? She said she changed her strategy. Instead of saying, would you like to buy a box of cookies? She said, would you like to invest in me? See, my dream is to take my mom on a trip around the world. And I don't want to have to wait till I'm 30 years old. Would you invest in me and make my mom's dream come true? They said people were crying. You know, on average, they bought a, bo a dozen boxes of cookies. Well, Liz crushed the record. She sold over 10,000 boxes of cookies, won the contest. Here's the thing. After three or four years of selling cookies, Disney came to her and said, we want to make a film about you. But it wasn't like a movie that you go watch at the theater. It was a training video to teach their employees how to sell. <laughs> Liz became a conference at speakers. I mean, a, what did I say? I think I'm asleep. <laughs> I think I'm frozen still. They said she became a speaker at conferences. Her mom went from two jobs to one job. She had more than enough money for college. And she took her mom on a trip around the world twice by the age of 13. Isn't that amazing? Because when the vision is clear, the results will appear, right? You know, there's so much I could teach you about goals and dreams. And so I put this together. I wanted y'all to have this. It's a little goal setting, like a checklist. I think we may have sent like a little QR code. If not, just go to terry.com slash goals. And it just gives you like this little checklist to help you set your goals for this year. Terry.com slash goals. That's just a free little download for you to just make for sure you're doing it the right way. Does that sound good? And I wanted to mention this. Pastor reminded me to tell y'all this too. I want to ask you to write down your top three goals that you are believing God for this year. What are your dreams? What are your goals that you're believing God for this year? And I want you to bring them tonight because we're going to come together and we're going to pray over these goals. You know, there is power in prayer. And the Bible says in Matthew 18, 19, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. So tonight, we're going to pray over your goals and I'm going to teach you how to activate the favor of God on your dreams. Does that sound good? So write down your three goals, bring them tonight, and let's pray over them. Okay, last thing I want to share, because I got to go fast. The fifth habit of the most successful people is they exercise. Here's what I discovered. I had to stop looking at the one hour you don't have, look at the 20 minutes you do have, and do something. And you might even say, Terry, 20 minutes is not going to change my body. But do you know that 20 minutes a day times 30 days in a month is 10 hours of physical growth, physical exercise, you're going to see a difference in 10 hours, aren't you? But here's one of the biggest things I began to learn and apply to my life. Yes, it's important what goes in your mouth as it pertains to weight loss and fitness, but do you know that it's equally or even more important what's coming out of your mouth? The Bible says that we are snared by the words of our mouth, right? That death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Well, when I turned 40, now I'm 53, but when I was 40, when my body went through changes, and then again when I was 50, you start sometimes saying things like, no matter what I do, can't lose weight. Or people would tell me, you just wait, your metabolism's going to be shot. And then you start speaking those things. Well, if you want to know where your life is headed, listen to the words coming out of your mouth, right? So I began to learn that I've got to take control of my words and to cut out <laughs> the negative self-talk, right? I don't want you to forget. If you're speaking negative words, cut it out. In fact, if you want to know if what you're saying is helping you or hurting you, practice making this statement after every phrase. And that's just the way I want it. No matter what I do, I can't lose weight. And that's just the way I want it. At this rate, I guess we'll be in debt forever. And that's just the way I want it. Nothing good ever happens to me, and that's just the way I want it. 
If it's not the way you want it, cut it out, right? So I made a list of positive declarations and I just began speaking them out loud. I'm fit, firm, and muscular. I'm in the best shape of my life. I have a phenomenal metabolism. I enjoy working out. I'm disciplined, spirit, soul, and body. I eat whatever I want to eat, and I maintain my perfect weight. You like that? I started backing it up with God's word. I said, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which I please. And you know what? My body started getting in line with the words of my mouth. So bottom line, change what you're saying, and you'll change what you're seeing, right? Does that help you today? Okay. Well, I want to bless somebody. I always like to give something away. And I have this kit I want to give to somebody. This is, I call it the discipline to reach your goals. This precious lady with the bun on the head, you were the first to raise your hand. <laughs> you want this kit? <laughs> Yay. This will help you. Yay. You're so welcome. Yeah. Okay. So, I want to, y'all want to stand up for a minute and let's get ready to wrap this up. Do you feel like you got something out of this? I hope so. <laughs> well, I was praying for you this morning in my hotel room, believing God that the right people would be here. And I literally thought maybe seven of you would show up, but I'm so grateful you came. And I want to say this real quick as I wrap this up. You know, I mentioned earlier about what I went through when I was 14 years old and you know, being raped on a gym floor. Back in 2010, my daughter, she turned 13 and she went with me on a trip to Australia and we were preaching all over Australia. And I thought, I'm gonna tell Cassidy what I went through. I want her to know. So we're sitting in our hotel room in Sydney, Australia, and I just told her the whole story. And Cassidy's sitting there and she just started bawling because she never knew what I went through. And she starts crying so hard and she said, mommy, what's his name? What's that guy's name? I want daddy to find him. I want daddy to beat him up. And I told her, I said, Cass, that guy, he's not the enemy. I said, yes, the devil works through people, but Satan is the enemy and he has one plan for every single one of our lives. John 10, 10 tells us his plan is to kill, steal and destroy your life. That's what he hopes from the moment you were born, he had one plan for you, kill, steal, and destroy your life. And I told Cassidy, I said, Cass, you know how I get the devil back for what he did to me? I said, did you see all those people that got born again tonight? I said, did you see all those people start to light up with vision again for their lives? I said, that's just like stabbing the devil. That's making him pay for everything he put me through. How many of you feel like it's time to make Satan pay for what he put you through? I do too. You know, every, every time I go preach somewhere, I take a selfie. I usually post it on Instagram, but I always send it to my mom and I say, mama, I'm going to go torment the devil today. Well, do you know, I think today is a divine appointment for many of you to make Jesus the Lord of your life and make the devil pay. Make everything you went through, make it backfire on him. Make him wish he had never gotten you addicted to drugs, never had you go through that with the abortion or the abuse or the affair or the rape or whatever you've been through, make it backfire on the devil today. How many of you feel like today's the day to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Let's raise our hands all over the place. I believe it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I believe it too. Well, here's what I would love to do because I believe God would send me all the way from Dallas, Texas to you this morning for this moment right here. How about, let's just seal the deal, make Jesus the Lord of your life and have him help you achieve impossible dreams. You're no longer having to do it on your own. You now have the power of God coming on you to do with ease what you could never do on your own. So why don't we lift our hands to heaven and everybody repeat this after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today. I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I declare Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross for me. I ask you into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. And I declare today, March the 19th, is a new beginning in the name of Jesus. Amen.
You did it! 